Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are joining from. So yes, uh, Victor and Samantha today are our guests. And it feels to me as though the people who are coming here are coming here because they know what they are coming for. We're talking grant writing, isn't it? For storytellers and artists, you know, everybody's out here chasing the bag. <laughs> and uh, we have wonderful guests today that will be sharing you know, their knowledge, their skills, and everything that they think can help us as storytellers and artists to write uh, better grants, to write for better grants and, you know, get the funding that we need to do our projects. Um, a few things for us to know before we kick off officially. This conversation is being recorded. So um, kindly be aware of that. We'll be sharing a full link to the recording with you later. It's also been streamed on Facebook uh, and you will get that throughout the uh, session. If you have any comments, please feel free to make use of the chats. But if you have questions specifically, make use of the Q&A box so that it's easy for us to find your questions and for our guests to respond to them when it is time. Also to let you know that today is quite packed. So we have two guests who are willing and very ready to dispense so much information to you. So we are going to be going 15 minutes beyond the hour. So that means uh, we won't stop exactly in an hour, but 15 minutes. And we're doing this to allow for more time for Q&A. So we'll be having a whole 25 minutes dedicated to your questions. So feel free, drop them, prep them, bring them, and it will be great. Uh, without wasting so much time, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers now, but very quickly, we have a short poll for our participants to answer. It will be coming up soon. So kindly fill in the poll questions and we will look at the results shortly during the session. We're going to give this just one minute, two minutes and we'll be done. So please do that. As you do that, um, allow me to introduce our speakers for today. So we have Samantha Nengumasha from Evos, uh, the organization. She is a regional project manager at Evos Southern Africa, a uh, resource of open mind projects, which is called ROOM. ROOM is central to the role of art and media in contributing to questioning dominant structures and bringing about pay, uh, change. Samantha's work includes working with critical content creators towards free and open society. She does this through grant making, capacity building, you know, project strengthening for individuals, for hubs, for organizations, academics, researchers, innovators of Pan-African heritage. And she does all this across the continent, working with creatives from Middle East and North, East and Southern Africa. And she's currently focusing on Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Welcome, Samantha. We're just going to tell you to say hello to everyone, and then we'll go ahead and introduce Victor. Thank you, and the very dense introduction you did. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome, Samantha. And uh, our next speaker, I feel like everyone knows him, but still, our next speaker is here to download so much, you know, knowledge to us today. His name is Victor Mark Onyebu, as you might already know. And Victor, over the last 15 years, has worked in several capacities in public sector, philanthropy, international development, and cultural relations. He focuses on arts and the creative economy program uh, in development and operations. He also does youth engagement, as well as policy research and strategy. Uh, Victor is currently the head of grants for portfolio at Africa No Filter. So yes, he is in-house, but he's generous enough to you know, bring his wisdom online today. Uh, and he oversees our grant making in arts and culture, media and research. Uh, under his leadership, ANF has funded over 150 grantees uh, in over 45 African countries to work on projects that tell stories better and tell better stories about Africa. His previous um, role includes delivering the British Council's art and creative economy, working in West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and adding value for the UK education sector in Nigeria and West Africa. So, Victor, just say hello to everyone. Let them know you're happy to be um, here. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Abim, for that. That was such a splendid introduction. I almost didn't realize it was me, my own Victor, you were talking about. But good to see you all and looking forward to that conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for dropping. I can see so many people from different countries. I see Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, Cameroon, Malawi. There's so many people, and we're happy that you're sharing your time with us today. And I'm just going to hand over to our first speaker for today. So note that I said we have two speakers. Both of them have um, beautiful things to present to us. So we urge you to stay till the end and keep your questions in Q&A. Uh, Samantha, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Abim Bola. And um, may I please just request to have my presentation on. I'm happy to be speaking in front of you. I see we have quite a dense audience and I'm really impressed with that. I've been given a task to make my presentation as practical as possible, to make it relatable and to make it easily doable. So I am going to be delivering uh, grant writing for storytellers and artists, uh, sort of at a beginner level, targeting beginner audience. So without taking much of your time, maybe I'm going to begin um, with talking about the organization which I represent, HIVOS, as well as the program, ROOM. And I'm also going to talk much more about the characteristics of a creative entity, because I do believe that this is what constitutes most of what is required for you to be able to write a compelling grant. And finally, I'm going to give you a, a grant writing checklist about things that you should consider um, in your grant before making that final submission. So not a checklist as such, but things to consider. So maybe we can get into about HIVOS and about the results of Open Minds projects. Um, so HIVOS is present in about 40 countries all over the world. It has regional presence in four regions, the Latin America region, Middle East and Northern Africa, Eastern Africa, as well as Southern Africa, where I am based and I am housed. So just generally for HIVOS, it um, tries to promote diversity and equality, as well as also combat things such as inequalities and injustices towards the aim for fairer and freer society. So we do have this dream that as HIVOS will be able to contribute towards um, sustainable economies, as well as inclusive societies. HIVOS is currently running under a strategic compass that has three distinct areas of impact. The first one would be climate justice, the following one would be JEDI, gender equality, diversity, inclusion, and finally civic rights in a digital age where the room project is based. So I won't repeat um, our presences in East Africa, Middle East and North Africa, Southern Africa. And we primarily work with youth. Um, I think Abimbola gave quite a detailed um, introduction about what the project represents, but we're all about criticality. And what we mean by criticality is just that, do we question society and do we provide, you know, alternative viewpoints? So our overall objective then becomes, how can we contribute towards progressive societies um, with a very pan-African context for the Room 2.0 edition and through the power of art and media. Yeah, I guess we can, this is the background about the organization. You can find more information on our website. Um, everything is available about the organization he was, as well as about Room, Southern Africa, East Africa, as well as the main region. Uh, the next bit would be now to talk more about things that I think you're mostly interested in being here. And it's what are the characteristics of a creative entity, individual organization. And this is what we want to talk about. And these characteristics are what you then communicate as your vision, which is what it is and your mission, which is how you're going to achieve it. So just generally there we'll be coming back to this landing page because I want us to recenter after reviewing and looking into one, I want us to come back and think of how each and every one of these components are related and also just reflect yourself on what is your vision, what is your mission and do you know yourself? So the first bit is obviously to ask the question of who are you as a creative entity, as a storyteller, as an artist and 
that's what I'm going to get into. So you need to know yourself to the extent that you have a brand and you have an image. So maybe we can get into the slide about who you are and I can talk more at length about why it is important for you to um, improve your grant writing. Is, is it consumers, is it customers, who are you working with and how do they recognize you? So that's why this bit is very important because even when you're now doing your grant writing, your brand is going to come out. It's what they're going to get at face value. So it needs to be important to have an image that is distinct from other, that can easily have you distinguished among different other submissions or different other grant writers or different other organizations that are working towards the same goal. So this is about identity. I think I can move into the value. I can't stress so much on value because it's conversations that I had every day about everything. You need to have value. And your value can be in terms of what skills do you have, what knowledge do you have, what information do you have or do you have access to, as well as you know what resources do you have? Are they human resources? Is it capital that you have? So you have to have a value and that needs to be reflected in your brand. The other thing is the design which is how you're going to you know, um, achieve your goals or how you're going to be perceived. And the design needs to be very clear and very articulate, and it needs to help to drive you towards your goals or towards your objectives, which is what I'll speak about later. The logo, again, I think it's a creative network, so I'm sure most of you already have logos. Uh, but again, the value of having a logo is just to make sure that you're represented in platforms where we don't need to know which name is it? We don't need to really um, capture different information, but because of your logo, we already know, huh, this brand is about this. And I think we can, if you saw the first landing page, it has an Apple logo, and that in itself tells you a lot about the brand. So that's why it's important to have that established logo that you can be identified by even before you start approaching your audiences or your consumers or the community itself. Um, the strategy is very important, and a strategy is not just something that you map out. It has to be a document. It has to be documented in your organization. You have to regularly check on it. You have to regularly update it. You have to monitor and evaluate your strategy to ensure that are you reaching your objectives or are you reaching your goals? So that's why it's very important. And your strategy comprises your brand because who you're trying to be is based on how you're going to do it and your strategy is the most important tool that will help you to establish your brand. The final two are quite related, which is advertising slash marketing. And I feel like most would think they are similar, but I think with advertising, it's more just reaching a broader audience. And with, but with marketing, it's a targeted audience. So you know who you want to reach. You know why you want to reach them. There has to be a benefit in that. And with advertising, you need to be known. You need to strengthen your brand. You need to have that identity across different other communities. So it has to be known over and over. And for some that are very successful, they've managed to be multinational brands. So that's why it's very important for you to have your image in place. And somehow, when you have the right image, it's placed at the center of three components. So there are your business objectives, which is what I'm going to talk about next. There's your target audience, which is very important about your stakeholders. And then there's also your positioning, which is something I'll, I'll talk about um, towards the end, which just generally talks about where do you belong. So this is a summary of the brand. And I want us to recenter back again before we get to the objectives. Let's recenter and see um, how we move on to the next one and how all these components are related. When we talk of goals, I think it feels very broad um, because most people feel like goals have to be big, which they should be, but there's a way of ensuring that you get to your goals through much smaller steps. And this is why it's important because each submission that you make uh, when you're writing a proposal, when you're writing a concept, it's because you're asking for help, collaboration, partnership resources to help you achieve your goals. So what is required for you to identify what are your goals and how can you make this process more easily doable for creators? So this is sort of um, the approach that I'm giving to this part and maybe we can get into that slide um, and I can talk more about how to look at your goals.
So like I said, goals are very broad. So when we're talking of goals, it's usually aims, it's, it's usually things that even yourself you can't achieve, but you work towards them as part of broader networks. So things such as uh, SDGs, for example, there are big goals that do not only depend on the work of the UN or any collaborators, but everyone is part of those goals. So similarly, you can have your goals and they can feed into things that are already happening out there, different progressive um, projects that are taking place that you feel like relate with the work that you need to do but you need to have objectives and objectives are more the things that you can accomplish and you need to think about what can you accomplish. So objectives are simply the things that you plan to do or achieve and you're thinking about them in a very smart sense, that they're specific, that they're measurable, that they're achievable, that they're relatable and that they're time bound. Those things are important when establishing what it is that you can achieve and they are the same things that you will need to document in your grant because they speak towards how can you work together towards achieving a similar aim or a similar goal. And in order for you to be able to do those um, objectives, you certainly need targets. And now targets are more actionable and much smaller steps. So you want to have a broader objective. What steps are required for you to accomplish that objective? And that's where your targets come in. So these are more smaller again milestones that you can say after i've done a b c d i move on to the next stage and it's really important towards that same objective and um, the part that uh, you're seeing on the bottom just talks about now the whole process of how do you come up with a goal how do you come up with an objective how do you come up with your targets and simplified is just look at what you have which are your inputs, consider what it is that you have. Is it knowledge again? Is it information again or access to information? Is it, um, are there skills that you have? Do you have equipment? Um, do you have talent? Do you have uh, capital or do you have uh, people? So all of those inputs that you have at your disposal are what you think about and what you can do with them, which are the processes. So what can you do with what you have? And then you figure out what is required for me to be able to transform uh, the human resources that we have to a meaningful output. And what kind of output are you looking for as a storyteller? So is it that you're looking for an audience? Is it that you're trying to pass on a message? Is it that you're looking for social change? You're trying to instigate dialogue in society? Is it that you're questioning something? So all of that it com comprises the process and you need to think about that. And the outputs now are all part of, you know, how you get to your objective. So the outputs are the immediate deliverable or the immediate, uh, immediate result. And usually they're very tangible um, as opposed to outcomes, which are more about what impact have you made? So you need to be aware of that. What is it that's tangible that's going to come out of this activity? And what kind of impact is it going to have? So that's all about um, thinking about what are your goals? What are your aims? How do you collaborate or feed into other existing goals? Um, how do you come up with objectives and targets? And usually this is in two parts. So you're thinking about it at an organizational perspective and you're also thinking it at project level because each project has its own objectives, but all of those, need to tie in again into the overall objectives or overall aim and goals of your organization, of your entity, of the broader um, brand that you're trying to represent. Um, again, to recent and maybe um, as you're seeing the slides, just think through, can you think of who you are and can you immediately tell what are your goals or is it something that you need to think about as a creative? So it's just a process as I'm presenting, moving on to the next one about stakeholders. Just maybe find out if you have all these qualities or if you have all this information, which you should have, if you have even more information. And um, let's move together through the different uh, characteristics of a creative entity. So the next bit would be about um, stakeholder engagement. Um, so stakeholder is quite a very long, long word. So stakeholders um, are just simply who are you doing it for and who can do it with you. So remember, now you know who you are. Now you have your objectives and your goals, but who 
is involved in your objective. So it's where you start thinking about that. And these are also people that are interested, people that are affected, people by, that are influenced by the project that you're trying to do or the goal that you're trying to achieve. Because it's always going to, if it's not affecting people, it's affecting the environment, which ultimately ends up affecting people again. So you need to be able to fully understand who are these people. So it's both ways. How to separate your beneficiaries from your benefactors is to see that who can provide you with and who are you going to provide for? And is that similar cycle of creating an ecosystem of coexistence between people? So what you have to do is you need to analyze who are these people? And you do that through whiteboarding. I think it's one of the techniques you can think of many other, but you need to know who are these people? Where are they placed? What are their interests? How are they influenced? How are they involved? All of these are important because they give a 360 spectrum and 360 view about who it is that you're going to be engaging or how well you're going to represent your stakeholders in your grant writing. So that's really important. And finally, you need to visualize it. So again, find out who are they, where are they, how do they look like, how old are they, what are their concerns. And this helps you with the delimitation process because now you understand that when you're going to work on a project, what are you going to be working on? It doesn't have to be broader. Like you just see a call and you think, yeah, let me respond to it. But now that you know your stakeholders, you know what to apply for, you know what to write for, and you know what does not fit within your um, goals and within your objectives because it's meaningless and void to do things that don't contribute towards your goals. So that's why it's important to understand your stakeholders. So again, asking for you to move with me. Uh, you now know who you are. You now know what your goals are. You are now thinking about who are your stakeholders. And maybe let's move to the tricky bit, which I think most creatives tend to shy away from. So I do know that most of you tend to shy away from systems and structures because they think or oh, it's myth or it's commonly said that creators shy away um, from organizations and structures. So it's really important now to look at that because this is the part I think um, that causes most of the com confusion when it comes to grant writing, but it, it just has to be simplified. And I've tried to simplify it through this diagram. So this diagram shows different functions that are essential for your organization to have good enough capacity to receive a grant, but you need to be able to demonstrate that in your grant writing. So your structure in itself, it tells whether or not you have a capacity. So from bottoms up approach, do you have different people, different teams that are working towards a goal? And it just depends with your capacity. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be a team. It just has to be a role or a responsibility. There needs to be someone who's doing your administration. There needs to be someone who's handling projects. There needs to be someone who's monitoring. There needs to be someone who's communicating what the organization is doing. So that's why these all are key components that need to be there. And as you write your grant, as you make your submission, you need to make sure that this is clear. And sometimes it's made clear through simple exercises, like you're asked to provide a work plan, and through your work plan, we can already tell that ah, this was not designed by someone who does monitoring and evaluation. So that's why it's important to have those skills um, or those roles and responsibilities, depending on your size. And above all these people that will be working together, there needs to be an executive. There needs to be someone who authorizes the work that is being done. But that someone, again, cannot be a solo signatory. So those are other dynamics that needs to be clear that can be easily be noted down as you're doing your ground try team or as you're making your submission that do you have this organizational capacity because it comes out and you need to be able to tick the box and say, yes, we do have the organizational capacity because we have the skills, we have the knowledge, we have the track record and we can demonstrate the impact that we have on the community. So these are required and about the executive because sometimes this is also where um, other submissions fail in the creative industry. They are almost headed by a founder. There's this founder syndrome that happens. The founder needs to report to something, someone. And usually that is the board. So you need to make sure that all of this is clear as you're making your submission. Sometimes it's very easy to tell by how you express your process, 
how you outline what activities you're going to do, how you write about, how you're going to be responding to a social problem, how you respond to a call itself, or how you present yourself. So it's clear what systems you have administratively. It's clear because of how what activity do you line up that you say you're going to be able to do. It can easily be picked. The same thing with communication. The first time that we see your name or that we get to know you shouldn't be when you make a submission, but I feel like you should communicate more, which is why I was talking about the importance of having um, a brand and an image, because you should be out there and you should be advertising or marketing or speaking very broadly, engaging wider audiences. Um, I'll move on, I think, to the final slide um, on this bit, which now talks about where do you belong? And I think this is very important because in the end, <clears throat> For successful um, proposal, you need to be able to know where you're positioned. And as artists, this is what matters. Like find out what it is that you do, what kind of media are you into? Is it audiovisual? Is it audio or visual? Because it helps to place you in the right positioning that is required. You need to be in the right place where you are valued, where you, you, you get your worth. So in order for that to be recognized, you need to correctly place yourself. And that's why strategic positioning is very important. So you need to know where your audience is, where are they located? You know, how will you be able to reach them? And what do you have to offer to, to your target audience that is going to be able to make them part of their project? That is going to give that assurance and build that trust that you are someone who has the organizational capacity and um, the goals and the aims and the objectives to reach um, a particular goal. Um, the final bit of my... Yeah. Letting you know that we have about... One minute, two minutes to wrap up. Thank One you. slide left. <laughs> Thank you. So the final piece is just, you know, a, a checklist that I need you to have because when you're now making a grant writing or making your final submission, it's things that, that, <clears throat> that should be on your proposal. So um, for example, when you're writing, you need to make sure that is it sustainable what you're going to be doing? And that's um, with the grant writing checklist. So you need to be clear with, is it sustainable the work that you're going to be doing? Because the sustainability is what gives them assurance and builds their trust that is something that you can do. You need to think beyond the, the now. You also need to think about, are you amplifying or are you innovating? Because you need to study the context. You need to fill in or find out what are the gaps, what are the opportunities, and you need to fill them in. So all of that is information that you require as you're making your final submission to say, do you have this um, characteristics? So I'm just going to ask for the final slide so that I'm sure that I've concluded, uh, which is grant writing, yeah. Um, so, Again, as you're looking at this, um, you need to build relationships and collaborate because you are not the only one who's working on something. So go and plug in and find out who is doing what, because sometimes when you make a submission like that, it shows how you can be able to connect the community to the cause. And in that sense, you're fusing into the social ecosystem. So it's really important for you when you're doing your grant writing to have this in order. So the final say is just to say, maybe please just, look through this, go through the questions, uh, introspect, outrospect, and retrospect, you know, connect the past to the present, to the future of what you're expecting and see whether you can position yourself um, to be able to write uh, better grants. So just to conclude. Thank you so, so much, Samantha. That was such a robust session. I mean, I don't apply for grants myself, but I saw you take us through the comms, the branding, you know, stakeholder analysis and grants writing. It feels like a foolproof way for any storyteller to ensure that they are putting their best foot forward when they are writing for grants. Very beautiful. Thank you so much. We also have comments from people in the chat talking about how clear the presentation is. So thank you. That was wonderful. Um, thank you. Um, next, we'll be moving to uh, the presentation by Victor. But I think before we do that, let's just look at um, the results of the poll we did before Samantha's presentation. Let's just quickly share that. Awesome. Uh, so we see that of all of us who are in the room, 
38% of us are content creators, 18% are journalists, 18% are authors, 12% are performers, and 13% are visual artists. That's awesome. In terms of uh, the biggest challenge that most of us are here to solve, many of us, 46% 46, 46 do not know where to look for funding opportunities. Uh, 28 find the grant application process complicated. I hope it has been simplified with Samantha's awesome presentation. And 27 say their grant applications keep getting rejected feel that for you, the next session of this webinar is going to be really, really helpful. Uh, what do you want to gain from the fireside chat? 38% of us want to boost our profile. And I know that Samantha, Samantha has sort of things to do with branding, you know, integrity, and just how to keep your profile, you know, visible. So funders are attracted to your work. 43% want to know how to design a project and budget. Look out for the next session. And 19% one tips on building and managing relationships. I mean, it's fantastic that the presentation we've had already speaks to a lot of this, but thank you for sharing your thoughts and we hope you will learn more from the next piece. Now, Victor, over to you. All right, thank you so much. I'll be sharing my screen now. And... Just, just to mention, Victor, we have 20 minutes for this session so that we can have enough time for question and answers. Sure. All right. So. Um... Let me know if you can see my screen, ladies and gentlemen. And so once my name is Mark Konyegbo. I'm grants lead at African Filter. Uh, those who just joined now and those who may not come across me and perhaps some of my nasty emails uh, saying yes or no. Uh, so I, what I'll do right now is to take us through uh, the grants process, right? And the the process for grant making is quite large. It's it's broad, it's quite convoluted, and it can get very confusing sometimes. But uh, first and foremost, I need you to understand that grants are conditional financial supports given by the government or by institutions to support a certain mission. The operational words here is conditional and mission, right? You've got to be mission aligned. You've got to be working in tandem with what the organization that is offering the grants is doing for you to be able to get the grants, right? So it's quite straightforward and it's conditional because no fund is free of charge. No grant is free. There's no such thing as a free um, uh, free money or free grants. There's always a condition. Your, your conditions could range from you know, trying to achieve social change or trying to achieve something else that is in furtherance of the mission of the organization giving this out. Now, I need to make a clarification before we proceed further. And that clarification is around um, grant writer first grant money. Um, like I said, the grant process is quite broad. The grant writer operates, in my opinion, more from the front end, while the grant manager operates from the back end. I am more of a grant manager. I spend more time um, taking part in selection processes. I take time in, you know, around managing the grant, ensuring that you judiciously utilize the funds that have been given to you, um, and then reviewing proposals that come from you. That's where my background is, and that's so I was speaking to you from that perspective. And so most of the things I would say would be things I'm approaching through the lens of a grant manager, as opposed to the lens of a grant writer who prepares your proposals and does all the research and then puts the right position to then attract funders. So I, th I thought it was important to make that clarification. I will breeze through some of these slides because most of them have been touched upon by Samantha in her very brilliant presentation. Um, the types of grants, of course, there are several types of grants, but I will, I will speak more specifically about, you know, the kind of grants using the African No Filter, my organization, where I lead grant making um, as a case study. Um, that's what we call the content generation grants. And of course, this is, this is related to the type of work we do. Um, and we do call them um, project support grants at African No Filter, which includes one of our most popular, most popular grant forms or grant categories called the Kekere uh, grants, the small grants. And I use the word small very carefully here. So it's not small in terms of the people who are receiving the grants, but in terms of the size of the grants, it's just about $500 to $2,000. That's the limit. It's aimed at um, enhancing, uh, supporting emerging storytellers, aspiring storytellers to do the work that they do. Right, and that's what we call the cake 
right? it's part of our content generation grant content generation grants goes to support projects we've also got the institutional support grants and as the name implies it supports your institutions it takes care of your overheads your operational support and just to keep the on to keep the the flag flying as we say in nigeria <laughs> Um, so it's meant to support your organization, as of, but you, you've got to be doing stuff that is mission aligned, that is aligned to the mission of African North Future. And I guess for every other institution out there giving out um, operational support grants, it has to be in tandem with the mission of the institution. And for African North Filter, you need to be doing stuff that is narrative shifting. We've also got capacity building grants, very straightforward for organizations that help capacitate other organizations, transfer knowledge, the exchange idea they incubate, they accelerate, and so on and so forth. So those are all capacity building related activities. Then we've also got the capital project grant. We don't do that at ANF, but it's a grant category. Some organizations do capital project grants. You know, you want to enhance your infrastructure, upgrade your infrastructure, and so on and so forth. We've also got the equipment grants. Um, let's go to the grant making approaches very quickly. Um, the most popular one is the open calls, request for proposals that are put out by organizations every now and then. And the open calls are very popular because that's how most organizations source ideas, source initiatives that can then further their mission. And then grants are offered to these institutions that provide those ideas and initiatives for them to then carry out their projects. Uh, but there's also something called the close calls. And I see a lot of institutions, grant givers or grant makers are tilting towards this um, these days, recently. Uh, close calls is where an organization relies on an existing network, an existing community of people of institutions that are already working in line with the mission and they go straight to those institutions and ask them to support proposals or respond to their requests for proposals, right? So that's a close call. It's not an open thing and you get approached by an institution and you're asked to then submit a proposal. Then we've also got rolling calls. Rolling calls is not a, a, a an approach, so to say, it, but it's, it's a, it's, um, those are grants that typically, I will say this, right? Every grant has a deadline. It has a start date, and then every grant request for proposal, um, grant makers always have a deadline. Some of them are short, four weeks, six weeks. Some of them can stretch up to a year, and it becomes a recurring, you know, opportunity. Then those are the opportunities we call rolling calls. For example, at African North Water, we've got the film fund. It was running last year, and then it's running this year and then hopefully it will run next year. And so these are rolling calls where, you know, the, 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 the timeline is quite extended, much more than, you know, you have for the other, the other types of calls. Now let's go to the key elements of a grant proposal. This is very, very important. If you don't get anything out of today's session, you should pay very much of attention to this particular segment. Um, for open calls, there's usually a stipulated guideline. There's a stipulated template provided by the grant maker. If you applied, if you've ever applied for grants from institutions like UNESCO, UN agencies, and so on, you would see that there's a structure, there's a format you have to follow. You have to, you have, you know, you've got to provide details and answers to a stipulated uh, template that's been put together by the grant maker, right? And so um, that's what happens for open calls, but it's a bit different from, for, when you're submitting proposals or you're requesting for support in an unsolicited fashion. And that's where you then need to pay attention, right? But for the open calls, still on the open calls, and when you're responding to a stipulated template, there's need to pay strong attention to the guidelines. You need to abide very, very strictly to the guidelines. The word counts, the number of pages, document format, it's very important. I, I can't, you know, I feel, um, it, it makes me feel a bit frustrated when sub submissions come in and you realize that this is a beautiful idea, wonderful initiative, but for some reason, they just didn't stick to the guidelines. The grant maker is asking you to submit all of these things in not less, not more than five pages. And you have all your beautiful ideas, but you just couldn't submit them in five pages. And you have 10 pages and 11. So these are low hanging fruits that are used to eliminate you from the competition. Right, so boxing yourself out of competition when you don't stick to the guidelines. Even little things like the formats, the font formats, the type of fonts used, right? It can put people off. I'm speaking to you from the perspective of somebody who is behind the table, who reviews proposals. The font format can even be very difficult to understand, be illegible, right? Is that the word? 
legible. So it, it could be difficult to read, right? And I know that sometimes when you're dealing with storytellers and creatives, you know, you, there's this there's this urge to want to add creativity and artistic, you know, uh, visibility, you know, to everything you're doing. You want to put some infusion of art, artistry to it. But I think we need to be very careful when we're doing that because it's very important that you do not put stress on the person who is going to review your proposal. And I will tell you the reason why it's very important as we move along. But for unsolicited um, grant proposals or the solicited ones where a format has not been stipulated, um, you need to then pay attention to the key elements, which includes one, executive summary, then the main body of, I will talk about the executive summary in more details in the next slide. The main body or the narrative justification of your presentation. And then you've also got the resourcing and the budget. So these are the three broad categories. There are lots of other in between steps and points that you can add, write, and expand. But these are the three broad categories and three major components of your proposal. If you're putting a proposal together in an unsolicited fashion, in the main body of your proposal, you should be providing your mission, you should be providing your vision, you should be providing your objectives, and then you should be providing alignment of your proposal to the aims and the objectives of the organization. There's got to be that alignment. Rationale needs to be very strong, otherwise you've boxed yourself out of competition already. Right, you've got to specify your target audience. It needs to be very clear. It doesn't need to be made out from the body of work you've provided. It's got to be very clear. And I do recommend sometimes if you have to use a bullet point, a bullet point, use bullet points to itemize what you're putting together so that you don't give the person who is reviewing your proposal the burden of reading through 250 words and then trying to make out, I think he's talking about objective here, or maybe the next paragraph is talking about objective. How about just giving a title objective and then you put bullet points of what your objectives are. How about using putting a title, you know, rationale, you put objectives, you the, use bullet points and then I tell your rationale. So it's easy for whomever is looking at your proposal, um, all of those uh, conclusions and then give you a score. So uh, let's move very quickly to a brief definition of, or not the definition rather, but let's unpack this subject of executive summary. I can't stress this enough. If you don't live here with anything, live with the fact that executive summary says a lot about, it's the first um, item of your proposal that a grant maker comes in touch with, especially for where you have not been given it, not been given a specific format to apply with and you're setting a proposal, your executive summary is as good as your success or failure, right, in that enterprise, in that endeavor. And so you need to pay a lot of attention. What I have on the screen right here is a real life example. I had to take permission from a real life example who has been successful within our grant um, opportunities to show you what a good executive summary looks like. There are several components of executive summary. Um, this does not have all the details right, the theoretical details, but it's capital attention. And I'm speaking as somebody who is looking at your proposal from the back end. I'm not putting your proposal together. I'm reviewing what you've submitted to me, right? This captures my attention. It starts with an opener and the opener is quite strong and very, very, very succinct, very precise. It's not, you're not beating about the bush, you're not rambling, you're not trying, you're not struggling to persuade. You know, you're hitting your points, you're marshalling your points out very, very clearly, right? I, I will not have the time to read through everything, but you would see that um, when you look at the opener, the lack of diversity in the scientific community is a persistent issue that affects young people's perception of who can be a scientist. That's a clincher. The email from old male from the West dominates the field, leaving little room for visible role models that, are, that reflect the diversity of STEM, right? That's a problem statement. To address this problem, you can see the correlation. The next paragraph then starts with, to address this problem. So the person who is putting this together already knows that with my first two sentences where I have identified the problem, to address this problem, I see the Root of Science podcast as a platform for Africans to blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So you can see this paragraph then talks about the solution and what this person is proposing, what this person is bringing to the table, right? Then, you then see the next paragraph talks about over the last XX number of years, I have produced XSS bi-weekly podcasts and visited local schools in my area to showcase the scientists featured on the show as a visible role model. The podcast that have 5,000 
60,000. Here again, you see track record. And these are key elements of your executive summary that clinches the attention of whomever is looking at it. Now, remember something which is very important. Sometimes when decisions are made, they come in their hundreds and possibly thousands. And there's just a handful of people at the back end who review these things. And sometimes they draw their first impression from your executive summary. So your executive summary has got to have a bit of virtually every other thing in your proposal a bit of every other thing in your proposal or indicators, but you've got to put something concise, captures the attention of whomever is going to look at your proposal and then give you a score, right? Now you can see track record is here. You can see capacity, you can see purpose, you can see the solution, you can see the proposition, you can see the opener, and then you can see the problem statements. These are all key elements. Let's look at another example. Now, this is another example. Actually, this is not a real life example. I made this up myself. I was just thinking, okay, let me just do something. Pay attention to the logical um, um, side of what you're reading at the fact that you know certain things have been captured in these documents. And then you would see some of the things I've mentioned about problem statements, things I've mentioned about an opener, things I've mentioned about stating you about your project, about your track record, and about what exactly you're asking for. They are all contained in these one, two, three, four, say four paragraphs or five paragraphs, right? So your, your executive summary should be well thought through. Most people prefer to do executive summaries at the end because by the time you're preparing your executive summary, you then have a full idea of what you have in the subsequent sections of your proposal. You know what your budget is, you know what rationale, you know what uh, active uh, uh, section is, you know what the program methodology is, and then you don't, you're now putting an executive summary together. Some people prefer to do it at the beginning, but whichever time you prefer to do it, whichever is convenient for you, is not important. The fact is that the executive summary, when you're submitting your proposal, should come at the beginning, right? So that's the first thing that is seen, and then the rest of the proposal can then follow afterwards. But I prefer to do an executive summary at the end of preparing the proposal. And then I put it at the top before the rest of the proposal put together. But this is very important. Now, the elements to pay attention to in your executive summary, who are you? Does the executive summary, when you read it to yourself, does it tell you who you are? Does it tell the person looking at your proposal what you do? Do you have a brief description of the problem and the cost indication? You would see in the first paragraph of this example on the left-hand side, there's an indication of the cost. We are writing to request $10,000 as support to our advocacy program to showcase the nuances of the community through storytelling. Blah, 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 and so on and so forth, right? Do you have few descriptions of your program or your project? You don't have to put all the details. Remember, you have enough time and other sections to then write out details of your program. But do you have a few indicators or descriptors of your program in your executive summary? program the right fit that's important and then you can close right we'll not have time to look through this in much details but let me go to the very next point now you these are nuggets these are things that you should bear in mind when you are putting proposals together and i'll um, run through this very quickly follow the guidelines strictly except where proposals are unsolicited even when they are unsolicited, you need to discipline yourself to follow certain guidelines. Mentally, put those guidelines in your head. Read through, research the organization, understand what they do, understand you know all, all they do, understand the way they've requested for their proposals in the past. There are some organizations that tell you all your submissions should come in one PDF document. And when you look at organizations and the grants they've made and look at the previous callouts, look at the RFPs they've put out in the past, it gives you an idea. Then if you have that kind of organization and then you're submitting five attachments in an email, the person who is looking at it is already put off by the fact that, look, I'm always used to seeing it in one PDF document, right? All of all the documents, supporting documents in one PDF document. And here I'm having five attachments. It's a put off already. It's a turn off already, right? So you need to be very careful how you approach organizations. It's pretty insight. If possible, provide your answers in bullet points. I can't stress this enough. Decisions are not only made on the quality of your idea, but on the clarity. You need to be extremely clear about your idea. Don't forget to grant access permissions for hyperlinked documents, right? You have a document, you have hyperlinked, 
and then the person who is reviewing your proposal clicks on the link and then it tells the person that you need to request permission to access this document and the person is now trying to send an email to you and then you come back to the person perhaps after another two days it's process every grant maker you know is bombarded with lots and lots of requests typically speaking right so there may not be patients there may not be so much flexibility in time for them to work with you all through the step, ask you permission, and this and that and that and that. It takes its time consuming. So you need to bear all of this in mind when you're putting your proposals together. Grant access permissions to whomever has the link even before you submit your proposal. It's very important. Avoid long preambles, except you've been told to give a narrative, you've been told to tell a story. Avoid concepts, definitions, and all those things that feels like you are trying to lecture the person who is reviewing your proposal, right? You're taking the person back to school. Like I said, they've been requested, but if they've not been requested, please go straight to the point as much as you can. Um, now, let's... Richard, just prompting, we have about two to three minutes to wrap up. Oh my, oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay, let me try my best. So let's look at resourcing and budget. It's very important that you understand that the amount you're applying for must be realistic. You can be applying for 500,000 to an organization that has a 20,000 grants limit, right? Because if they give you 20,000, you've still got 480,000 to look for. And it's not realistic that you'll be able to look for 480,000 to then complete your project. So you need to research organizations well. If you're not applying for the full budget requirements, where are you getting extra funding from? Research the funding partners is very important. Then review the past grantees of the organization to have an idea. Now, let's see, think about budget. Now, do not pad your budget. And there's, there's this confusion most people have about the ratio. The safe ratio to use is 70 to 30. Your project should take 70% and your overhead costs should take 30%. We can talk about this later when we have some time, perhaps in the Q&A. Separate the revenue and expenditure on your budget. Be mindful of your capital spending on content grants. I can talk about this, but it's a red flag. When you spend a lot of money content grants, you spend a lot of money on equipment, you spend a lot of money on renovations and utilities, it's a very big red flag. You're very likely to get a no. Don't bore your budget with your budget. Don't bore the person with them. And always find out the currency in use. We are operating in US dollars and you're sending me a proposal in Kenyan shillings and you expect me to then spend some time right, and convert from Kenyan shillings to US dollars to end it every time I see an amount on your proposal. It's a bit of a stress. And so these are literally two things you need to be mindful of. Now, I will run very, very quickly. If I have just five minutes, five minutes, I beg you, um, Abimbola, five minutes to run very quickly through this last couple of slides. This is behind the scenes and what happens when we make decisions at the back end. Do I have your permission to go for at least five minutes, at most rather, Let's five minutes, just five minutes? Three minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. So for your key considerations, you need to be sure that you're eligible. Organizations have key factors like gender, geography, sector, and age to confirm or to, I am, you know, to, as indicators of their priorities. And these are balancing factors. They make these decisions behind the scenes. And that's why this slide or this section is titled behind the scenes. You need to be sure you are eligible. And this comes down to research. For open calls, you need to pay attention to what the long listing criteria are. They are usually criteria for long listing and they are criteria for short listing, right? And you need to pay very strong attention to this. Um, for unsolicited requests, you must research the organization. You just can't run away from getting all the information you need from an organization before you send it an unsolicited request. Know what their priorities are. Know what their program focus is. Now, for an organization like Africa Nofuta, we have four questions, four key questions that we use to determine whether to go ahead with, an, with a proposal or not. Who are you? Your proposal should be able to say who you are. Your proposal should be able to say what we are funding, right? A lot of people tell a lot of stories and they, at the end of it, reading all the stories, you're asking yourself, what exactly are they asking for funding for? Because it's now missing and embedded in four, five, six pages of storytelling, right? So you need to be very careful about the amount of stories and narratives you put and go straight to the point about what exactly we are funding. How does this idea shift the reciprocity of Africa? Now, this is peculiar to us as an as a narrative change organization, right? Other organizations might have their own questions on this. Do, do you have the capacity? Those who are saying yes, do they have the capacity to deliver? And then some other organizations could also ask questions like, is this scalable? 
Is this sustainable? What is the duration of the program? But these are key points to bear in mind. Now, when you're talking about presenting your projects, because at some point after your long listing and short listing, you have the opportunity to present or somebody will present on your behalf. Where you're presenting by yourself, that's a direct pitch or an interview. Have your elevator pitch, summarize your mission. Have them in one, two, three sentences. Off the top of your head, you can say exactly what your organization is about, right? It's extremely important. Now, for indirect pitch, you can't run away from making your proposals very clear. They've got to be extremely clear because when somebody is pitching on your behalf, usually within the grants team, sometimes people are assigned specific projects to pitch to the rest of the team or to the selection panel. It happens. It's not every time you get the opportunity to then come and defend your proposal. Sometimes people are meant to do that on your behalf. And you can imagine the amount of stress and burden you have put person through when you know you have all of these things not clearly stated on your on your proposal. So it's very important to be extremely clear because you don't know if you have the opportunity to pitch yourself or if somebody is going to be doing that on your behalf. Like I said, don't forget the power of bullet points. You can use bullet points to make these things clear. Now let's look at do's and don'ts. And I'm coming very close to the end. I think in the next 30 seconds I should be done. The do's and don'ts from the back end. President, I look at proposals, I review proposals, and these are key things you must bear in mind. Make sure you're eligible to apply, research the organization. I've said this before. Review so clear and avoid always have high level budgets at hand so you have your budgets that has the details but also have the budget that has just the top points the top liners right expenditure revenue uh salaries uh equipment and so on so you've got those top liners and they have the cost attached to them so it's very important to have your high level budget be clear avoid ambiguity right convert your financials to the currency of the grant maker i said this before you can't be applying to an organization in the united kingdom that uses and putting your you know application in naira nigerian naira and then you expect them to then do the conversion it's just yeah, it's, don't have that time we now advise strictly to the people. guidelines <laughs> <laughs> join networks and communities form partnerships um the don'ts are on the right hand side i hope perhaps i might get a few questions that then helps me elaborate further on on some of these things but um it's been a pleasure speaking and um hopefully we'll have much more time to go through these things in more detail subsequently. Thank you. You know, I almost feel guilty for having to cut this short because genuinely <laughs> the amount of value that this presentation has added. Thank you so much, Victor. This is beautiful. And I'm very, very sure that a lot of people on the webinar today can really attest to you know, the fact that they've learned a lot, starting from Samantha talking to us about the front end and you giving so generously sharing, you know, what it is that happens at the back. So uh, we've eaten into Q&A time, but we're just going to go straight to it, uh, starting in the order in which they appear. The first question will be taken is from Julius Odeke. I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. He says, I'm pretty concerned about the target groups, especially the age brackets. I assume this re refers to like funding requests. It's always from 18 to 35 years. This leaves a formidable force behind that that has experience without any source of funding to help them tell stories. How shall those aged above 35 be helped? I think this question, let's give it to Samantha. Samantha, what do you, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I do think that if they just go back into the presentation and think about positioning, if you are finding many uh, opportunities that are targeted at 18 to 35, then you now need to go back again, stake, uh, map your stakeholders, know who supports what you're doing, because they are people that are supporting that. They are, some have those age restrictions, some they do not, but it means that you now need to be active about finding the opportunities that are best suited for you. Um, but for, for our programming, I'll just say it's because we support front runners and you know, the more youthful you are, the more able you are to carry forward um, the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for that brilliant answer. So the response is positioning, you know, do your research, find a way to show how <clears throat> you add value. Um, a lot of people are asking if we're going to be getting copies of the presentation. And yes, you are, but in the form of a blog, we're going to be publishing a blog that summarizes all the key points from today's session. But the live recording is going to be available um, <clears throat> on our YouTube channel. It's also being uh, streamed live right now on Facebook. So you're going to have access to all this information through the blog and the recording. 
Uh, the next question asks, as an independent artist working alone, so for example, you're looking for a grant to put on a stage show, how do you get around not having a structure, like a board, ex exec team, ETC around you? Um, Victor? Um, thank <laughs> oh yeah, Samantha, please go for it. Yeah, um, I think if you're a startup um, and you're working as an individual, then find where you can outsource the services. There are so many organizations that do fiscal hosting, which means they take care of the administration for you at a fee, of course, and you get to concentrate with what you need to do. So you still can be able to build your brand as an individual, but also use the support. That's why I was also saying fuse into the ecosystem um, and use the support of entities that have the capacity to handle the grant or the fund on your behalf. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, some questions here have actually been answered by Victor, but I'm just going to ask this one. Someone says, if I wanted to request uh, for a grant to publish my storybooks for children, directed to Mr. Victor, which category would my request fall? Uh, if it looks very much like it could be a project support. It could also be a an operational support, right? But I think it sounds more like a project support. You're trying to do something. Perhaps you're going to do some outreach. You will do some advocacy. You're putting something together that has a beginning and an end. It's got a timeline. So it's most likely going to be a, a project support. In terms of your answering your question about the category, I think it's a project support grant. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, the next question also to Victor, someone says on formatting, let's say they ask for five pages, can we still be eligible when I submit less pages like three pages? Yes, I, what, what the, the, the number of is usually a maximum limit. Maximum of, uh, what you should be talking about submitting five pages if that is the stipulation, but I think you're, you're fine submitting less than that. Awesome, thank you. Dear Samantha, my name is Odala Banda from Malawi. I run a media production called Innet Media Works. Question is, in your recent call about Room, you said you're looking for producers or organizations that have audited financial statements. So in that case, how can someone get through the system if they are applying for their first projects? Um, thanks for that question. So you will note that you applied for a grant that is probably beyond the capacity that you have. And that's why we publish those requirements is to easily let you know what is required for a particular type of grant or not. So we do have those ones. Those are called amplification grants. They are for much bigger, much more established organizations with the right systems. That's why that is a requirement because you need to demonstrate that trust that I spoke about earlier. Uh, but we also have what are called production grants where we support startups, proper startups from the ground up. And just depending with the process of, do we see your work? Are you able to make it? I think Victor spoke about the closed core, open core criteria. So it just depends with um, what criteria we end up taking in terms of the calls, but they are uh, calls uh, for much more startup organizations and we do support that. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm hearing is because there's a lot of questions around, I don't have experience, I've never done this before, how do I make sure? So again, Samantha mentioned positioning, and now looking at the calls, what are the calls asking for? And it might be a case of finding the calls that appeal to you and the current level that you are in at that time. Uh, we have a question from Mariam Enani. She says, Victor, would you mind elaborating on the 70-30 ratio for projects overhead? And what is the procedure for closed calls? How do I make my way in? Those are two different questions. But... Yeah, let me start with the closed calls. Organizations um, these days are tilting, not every, but there's a huge trend in organizations tilting more towards um, closed calls. Closed calls is where there's a community of people, a community of organizations that are doing stuff that are related to what the mission of that organization is. And so sometimes they feel uh, rather than go to the open market, which is an open call to go source for ideas, why don't we then rely on? So it's becoming a very huge grant making pipeline, communities and networks. And so in terms of breaking through, you need to begin to identify communities you know, that do stuff that align with your mission, your mission as an organization. And then um, those communities have, have 
increasingly become grant making pipelines for institutions that support stuff in that in that area, whether it's in gender, whether it's in some other social causes and so on. So communities and networks are very important. I didn't have so much time to um, 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 to speak about this and emphasize the importance of it. Mm -hmm. Then the first question was about the 70-30 budget uh, splits. Now, um, it's not cast in stone, right? There are cases where you can, your overhead costs, and when I say overhead, I'm talking about salaries mostly. Salaries is what constitutes your overhead mostly, right? So your overhead costs should not go more than 30%, except you it definitely has to, and then you provide the justification for it, right? But the, the healthy margin is 30%, so that 70% of your of the money being given to you or the, the money that you're requesting for your project can then be spent on the project itself, right? And when I say 70%, you also need to be very careful because when you take out of that 70% to then do capital projects or capital intensive activities like renovations and so on, um, it, it adds to your asset as an organization. And so indirectly, it's going back to your organization. So um, someone like me would take out the amounts that you're spending on capitals and add it to the 30%, right? Because you are actually retaining all of this. It's coming back to you. It's facilitating the project, yes, but in a way, it's um, it's taking out of the project, the money that should be spent on the project cost itself, because ultimately it's something that is adding an asset to your organization. So if it's not an asset related grant, remember I talked about capital grants, I talked about um, 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 equipment grants and so on. If it's not those types of grants, then you need to be very careful about how you split and make sure that 70% or slightly less than that is going to things that facilitate the delivery of the projects. You know, you're doing some outreach programs yeah. you're doing advocacies and so on yeah. but not on salaries oh, and capitals okay, okay. Yeah. thank you samantha i would like to get your response on this someone says what if i have uh julius caesar kasuja says what if i have a non-solicited proposal idea and i want to send it to several organizations you know just to pull the tail and see who bites what should be my approach um from a creative point of view i feel like what you're saying is you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket i don't think there's ever a problem uh, most of the times i think even with with project it now just comes with your capacity because if one funder wants that then they're going to come with requirements as to how you're going to implement that project so once you've shared it with one and they're going to support you with it no one else can support you with it. It's not going to cause any animosity. I think if anything, we do like that you create this net networks, establish the trust. And if you have more that are willing to support you on your projects, I'll say start thinking about other projects, you know, <laughs> make sure that you have increased support. Uh, don't be dangling a carrot, um, seeing who bites into it. Rather just invest into what helps you to move forward because at the end of the day, what we do is support your work and we want to advance what already you need to be accomplished yeah awesome thank you there's a very interesting question here i'm eager to hear both your responses someone asks tinashe ziswa is it a red flag to submit multiple grant proposals or ideas and i'm guessing to one person you know is it a red flag or to one organization or one funder um samantha do you want to go with go first or should i Okay, um, for, for me, it's not a red flag, right? Um, we identified several grant categories and you have an idea that is a capacity building idea. You have an idea that fits into project support or you have an idea or a range of ideas and you think your organization needs support to just keep the lights on because you're doing something that is extremely um, aligned with the mission of African North Delta, which is shifting stereotypical, harmful stereotypical narratives about Africa. If you're very confident about your idea, uh, you can propose about capacity building at the same time propose about, you know, um, um, a specific project that you want to deliver in line with our mission. So I don't think it's a red flag, but this varies from organization to organization. Some of the other organizations have rules about this because of how large they want to, how, how much they want to democratize the opportunity, so to say. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And Samantha? Yeah, I think that also depends on a lot of factors. I was meeting different proposals to the same call like that raises a lot of questions. Um, are you submitting to different programs? 
Um, and also, what does the organization say about sharing with you money? Because it's all about trust. Okay, are you able to handle five open grants at the same time? Uh, do you have the systems and structures for it? So we are, all of that is going to get assessed. There's no way that you're going to get that easy trust. And also, I think when you have the capacity, it's accepted. When you don't have the capacity, it quite feels like more can you imagine. <laughs> Um, sending different submissions. So it's always good, at least be intentional about what you want to do. If you have good intentions, then obviously the reviewers, they always give it their attention. But if your intention is just to say, let me spam and, and see what comes out of it, then you're not being specific and you're not being intentional about the outcome. And it will in turn affect you, uh, not so much to, to the team doing the review. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have four minutes left to wrap up this session, but there are some crucial questions. Uh, so we'll take just one or two more. Um, this is for Victor from Bill Oduo. If you are applying for a development fund and they ask you to state the total amount for the whole production and the amount you need for development, what is the appropriate ratio or percentage you should ask for development? Well, um, I hope the capital intensive um there is no sort of ratio than the rest of the rest of the project the rest of the project but one thing i want you to pay attention to is the fact that um organizations want to be sure that you can deliver and have an out at the end of the day and so um you see organizations tending to spend a lot of time or putting lots of importance and priority around the latter stages of a project. So the production and post-production and then the finishing touches and then the marketing and stuff. Because at that point, the risk is less compared to development. And so when you that you need to bear these sentiments, internal sentiments in mind, because these are the sentiments that guide decision making and the organization. And your proposal should not have so much dedicated development to the detriment of what should then be the latter and finishing stages, because ultimately it's the latter and finishing stages of your project, whether it's the post-production or there and stuff like that, that the organization can then beat their chest and say, we've got something in the marketplace that then speaks or advocates for us. So to be able to mind when you're putting your uh, budgets together. Awesome, thank you. Um, there's a last question, it's quite cheeky. This person has directed it to the entire ANF. They said, ANF from John Namai, will you be op opening funding for performing arts? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has an answer to that, but if you do, that's our final question. Um, yes, Africa No Filter, we do have, and you know, it may not be the category that you, you have in mind. We have our Kekere grants that are open to um, storytellers, uh, but then the range is between $500 and $2,000. Um, we also have um, unsolicited, we have room for discretionary grant making, unsolicited grants, um, where you can then send a proposal to us and then on the merits of your of your ideas, we yeah. look at it and, and there's no restriction. Awesome. Or what sectors it could actually yeah. be a, perfor a performing arts or performing arts project that you then send a proposal on once you're able to apply all of these things we said today hopefully you know um, <laughs> you might just be able to get a yes on yeah. those but i would say that there is no currently speaking as we speak there is no dedicated grant on performing arts just the way we have for film and for comedy and so on. We look at that website and we've got good reasons for that. We've got our reasons, internal reasons for that. But yeah, you still have the opportunity of sending your proposals in an unsolicited fashion and we'll pay attention to it as well. Thank you so, so, so much to, first of all, the panelists today for bringing their wealth of knowledge and skills and showing us all these tips, hidden and unhidden. And uh, I'm very sure that we've learned a lot. Thank you to all the attendees as well. Thank you so much. My name is Abin Bola. It has been lovely having everyone here on board. Thanks, Samantha. Thanks, Victor. Um, and see you at the next webinar. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.